Welcome everybody. My name is Saskia Hilteman. I am a bioinformatician from the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And today I will be walking you through the 16S microbial analysis with mother tutorial from the GTN. As you can see, we're going to do the short version of the tutorial. And there's also a extended version. And these two tutorials do the exact same analysis, um, except in this tutorial, we will run it as a sequence of small workflows. Um, uh, but in the extended version, we really run every tool manually and really go into the details of all the parameter settings. And actually at the beginning of each section in this tutorial, you can switch between the uh, short and the extended tutorial. So if there are any of these sections that you want a bit more detail on, I encourage you to click this link and look at the uh, extended tutorial. Um, but for this video, we will use the uh, short version. It's a little bit less clicking and we can focus more on the concepts and the results. Okay, so this tutorial can be found in the metagenomics section of Galaxy of the GTN. Um, here I will be using the US Galaxy server. But you can use whichever Galaxy server you want. And I do recommend that you access the GTN tutorials via this little hat icon in Galaxy, because that way you get some nice integrations where you can click on a tool name in the tutorial or workflow to load it directly into Galaxy. So you don't have to search for it in the sidebar. Okay. <clears throat> so what we're going to do in this tutorial is we're going to follow the standard operating procedure, the SOP, for MySeq data, as it was developed by the creators of the Mother tool package, um, the Schloss Lab. Um, and this is the overview of what is in this analysis. So we're going to start by getting our data into Galaxy. We are going to put it into a collection to make it a little bit easier to work with uh, larger numbers of samples. <clears throat> then we will start off with a quality control step um, so we want to really make sure that our data is of high quality, that we clean it, that we remove any low quality um, data so that we can really uh, proceed with our analysis with only um, high quality data. Then we will do an alignment step. Uh, we will remove chimeras. So we'll do a little bit more cleaning based on this alignment. Uh, we will do a taxonomic classification and then we can remove some more non-bacterial sequences because we're only at interested in uh, bacteria for this question. Um, uh, we will show you how you can use a mock community to assess the error rate of your method. Uh, we will do some OTU clustering, diversity analysis, and finally um, some visualizations with Corona. Um, so this is a 16S analysis. So here we sequence the 16S ribosomal RNA gene um, in order to classify um, the organisms in our uh, sample. And the reason we use this molecule is because it is uh, present in all prokaryotes. Uh, it is, has highly conserved regions as well as highly variable regions, which is depicted here. So we can use the conserved regions to target this gene uh, across different organisms. And then we can zoom in on these variable regions to uh, distinguish between different organisms. So in this tutorial, we will use the V4 region for this. Uh, you may see some other regions used or combinations of regions um, for uh, classification. And it's also a very established method. It's been around for a long time. There are huge reference databases. Everything has been polished. Um, so it's a pretty robust method. Um, yeah, so you can read up about this a little bit more, some links here. Um, so then the data we are going to analyze uh, also came from the Schloss Lab, the creators of Mother Tool Package. Um, and they described their experiment as follows. Um, they were interested in understanding the effect of normal variation in the gut microbiome on host health. So they collected feces from mice on a daily basis for a year. And during the first 150 days post weaning, um, nothing was done to the mice. They just let them uh, eat, get fat and be merry. And they uh, compared 
uh, in this tutorial, we will compare the first 10 days to the last 10 days. Um, so um, yeah, here's this depiction. Uh, so this is a lot of um, data uh, samples. So we follow one mouse, uh, first 10 days, and then um, some days at the end. Um, one more uh, note about uh, the naming schemes. So all the files will are named like this when we import them. The first bit of the name is um, indicates here female three, so female mouse number three on day zero. And because we did paired end sequencing, uh, each sample will have two files, two FASTQ files, uh, one with the forward reads with this underscore R1 in the name and one with the reverse reads with underscore R2. Okay, so that's our data. Let's get it into Galaxy first. Um, so there are several ways you can do that. Uh, so the standard way uh, is we all our data is in Zenodo. So you can uh, expand this box, copy it here, and then paste it into the upload data tool here on the left of your Galaxy. Uh, under paste fetch data, you could paste the uh, files there. I'm not going to do it this way. I'm going to show you another way. Uh, so by the way, make sure you have a fresh history that is empty. Uh, if you don't have that now, uh, hit this plus button first um, and give your history a good name. So I'm going to call it 16S with mother. All right. Okay. So the other way you can get data for tutorials, did you not, did I not hit save? 16S uh, with mother. Save. There we go. Okay, so the other way you can get uh, data for tutorials into your Galaxy is under shared data. So the big galaxies have this um, under shared data, data libraries. They provide all the input data for uh, all the GTN tutorials. Um, so this uh, is a little bit faster than um, importing it from URL and it also, it doesn't count against your quotum in Galaxy. So it saves you a bit of space too. So um, here you see, um, there are all sorts of, um, of data sets they offer here, lots of public data sets or reference data sets. Uh, we are going to search for GTN. And then you see here this GTN material. Inside this data library, you will see that it is organized by topic, the same topics as in the GTN. So we are going to go to the metagenomics section. And then inside here, we will see our uh, all the tutorials from that topic that have uh, data here. Uh, we're going to go to 16S microbial analysis with mother. Um, there may be different versions of the data set if the uh, tutorial is ever updated with the new data sets. Um, you will get multiple versions here. So for today, we're just going to use this one with the highest number. And then we see here all the files. We see here indeed um, files named like F3D0 underscore R1 FASTQ. Uh, we're just going to import everything. So we have here um, data from the early time points and data from the late time points. And we also have some more um, reference data. Uh, so 46 in total, you can see at the bottom here. So let's uh, add this to our history with this button at the top. Uh, you can choose to make it a collection or data sets, but we're going to import it as data sets. And then we will create our collection with only our FASTQ files, only our sample files. Um, later. So this will take uh, a second to load. Uh, you can choose which history to send it to. Um, by default, it'll be your active history. So that's usually what you want. Um, there we go. Uh, or you can create a new history. So hit import. And then uh, we can start analyzing. Okay, so you should see this green box uh, pop up when it's done importing. 
and then you can click there uh, to go to your history or you can always click this um, home button to at the top. Okay, so you see it imported 46 files. Um, so some of these are uh, reference uh, data sets that we'll, we'll use later for classification and alignment. Um, and then if you scroll down, you see our uh, FASTQ files of our mice, and we also have the uh, mock sample uh, to FASTQs. So we are going to um, take all our FASTQ files and put them in a collection to make it a bit easier to work with um, large amounts of samples. So we just analyze the collection once and we don't have to repeat this for every sample. Um, so we're going to filter our history for the FASTQ files to make it easy. So you can do this by um, typing anything in this box. So we're going to type FASTQ. You see it filtered our history. Um, and then we want to select all these FASTQ files. We're going to take, uh, click this checkbox icon uh, and then choose select all on the right. And then it tells us it has 40 um, selected. So uh, we do indeed have um, 20 samples um, each uh, paired in, so 40 files. Uh, those are the mock sample and our real data sets. So we're going to take these and say, uh, with these 40, we would like to build a list of data set pairs. Um, then you get to this um, collection builder window. It will try to automatically find the pairs based on the names. Um, you see it doesn't find anything now, but that's because it's looking for underscore one and underscore two. So depending on your sequencer or where you got your data from, uh, there are different conventions. Uh, so sometimes it's underscore one and underscore two, and sometimes it's underscore R1, and underscore R2, like in our case. So you can just edit these values, um, and then you can say auto pair. And now you see that it's found the correct ones that belong together, and it will name each pair with this uh, sample name. So that looks good. So at the bottom, we're just going to give this collection a name. I'm going to call it uh, mouse samples. Uh, you can call it whatever you uh, want. And then we hit create. And then we can uh, exit out of this um, selection. Um, so um, it also detected that we uh, did something now with it. So I think it's going to change our view again, um, but we still have it filtered now at the top here, so we can remove this filter for FASTQ by clicking on the X, and now all our data is visible again. So you see now that we have now, um, this is all our reference data, and our FASTQs have now been moved to this collection. <clears throat> And if you click on this, it looks as one item in Galaxy, and you can treat it as one input, but behind the scenes, it's really a list of 20 pairs. And if you click on one of these, you see that each of those pairs, again, has um, two files behind it, the forward and reverse reads. And if you look at one of these, you see these are uh, FASTQ files. Um, yeah. We can look at them in the middle, but it's pretty standard. Uh, the read name, the sequence, and the uh, quality score. Okay, um, so we're gonna go back to our main view with this button up here. Okay, so now that we've got our data into Galaxy, we can move ahead to our um, analysis. And we are going to start by uh, doing some quality control. So we do also have a dedicated quality control tutorial. So if you're interested in these uh, concepts, I recommend you look at that. Um, so this is usually the first step of any analysis because you want to uh, be sure that you are working with high quality data, that you throw away any noise, any uh, low quality data before proceeding with your real analysis. Uh, so one thing we could do in our case is we can um, combine these paired reads uh, to create contigs. And uh, we can also use this to improve the quality. And that is because uh, we are targeting the V4 region. Uh, we know this is about 253 base pairs long. Um, and our sequencing is about 250 base pairs long. So we take this molecule, this V4 region, uh, we sequence it from both ends, uh, 250 base pairs. So most of this will be overlap between the forward and reverse reads. Um, so we can use this overlap to also uh, improve the quality. 
So it's depicted here in this image, what happens. So um, here you have this forward read and you find overlap with this reverse read. So most of it is overlap. There will be a few bases on either end that do not overlap. Um, so for those, you just, um, and from these two, you make the consensus sequence. So if there's no overlap, you just copy um, the only information that you have. But if there is some overlap, so for example here, uh, in this position, the forward read called an A with a confidence of 10. So the higher this number, the higher the confidence. The reverse read agreed that it was an A and was even more confident. So in our consensus contig, we will say that this position we call an A and we can increase our confidence because these two agreed. Uh, so the same for these other positions that uh, agreed. Uh, and then if there is disagreement, so for example here, the forward read called a T in this position and the reverse read an A, um, but this T was uh, called with much more confidence than an A. So we, um, in our contig, our consensus contig, we call this a T, but we lower our um, confidence a little bit because of this conflicting call in the reverse read. Um, sometimes it can happen that both of these are low quality. For example, if this uh, T was called with a uh, confidence of five and this A also five, then we really don't know what to call this. So then we call this, uh, put an N here and no call, uh, and we call that an ambiguous base. Uh, so we're really not sure what happened there. Um, so the tool that does this in Mother is called Make Contigs. Um, so it will look at each of these pairs, uh, find the best overlap, and then generate this consensus contig. Um, so let's run this tool now. So um, if you started your uh, um, this tutorial via Galaxy by this hat icon here, you can just click on this tool. Uh, otherwise, you have to look for the name here, uh, searching for tools. So you could write the tool name here, and then it'll pop up, and you click that. So however you get there, make sure to start the make context tool. And then as input, we are going to give it our um, collection of sample pairs um, and the rest we will leave to the defaults. So here at the top, um, it asks us the way we want to provide these FASTQ files. So if we only have one sample, we can just give it a, a forward and a reverse file. And maybe we have a single pair. Uh, but in our case, we have multiple pairs. We have a collection of pairs. So we're going to choose this uh, combo mode. Um, then it detects this is our only collection, uh, paired collection. So it'll automatically select that one. And we leave the rest to defaults. And then we just hit run. All right, so while that runs, um, we will uh, move on. Um, and the next step we can do is we uh, will do some data cleaning. So this is where our first workflow comes in. Um, so we can do some cleaning based on this, uh, on these contexts, on this data. So we know that the region we targeted is about 250 base pairs long. So if any of our contigs are much longer or shorter than that, uh, then we know there's probably something wrong, either with sequencing or with finding this overlap. So we are going to say um, we're going to use the screen.seeks tool to do this filtering. We are going to say, for example, that any contigs longer than 275 base pairs should be removed because they're probably not useful. Um, we can also remove uh, low quality contigs, so ones that had a lot of these ambiguous bases. Um, we can set our own thresholds in uh, in this uh, screen.seeks tool. I think we're going to allow no ambiguous bases, so we're going to be very strict, um, but that will be our uh, quality control. Um, the last step we will do is we will deduplicate sequences. Uh, because of the nature of this experiment, so we're targeting this S16S gene um, across all the organisms in our sample. And because we will have many of the same uh, organisms with the same 16S uh, sequence there, we will have lots of um, 
identical sequences in our um, samples. So this is totally expected and fine. Um, but we don't necessarily want to continue our analysis with all of those. Uh, for example, if we're going to align our sequences to the reference database in the next step, it doesn't make a lot of sense to um, uh, align the identical sequence a thousand times. Uh, we only need to do it once. And then if we just know that this one sequence represents a thousand sequences in our sample that it occurred a thousand times, um, then we can still draw all the same conclusions. Uh, so that is what accounting these sequences does. So first we get all the unique sequences and then we just remember in something called a count table, with their count table, we remember how many of these unique sequences, um, how many duplicates were found in each of our original um, samples. All right, so um, before we start this, we will have a look at the output of make context. Uh, but we will do that uh, as soon as it's finished. So now that make contigs has finished, we can have a quick look at the files it created. Um, so you see here it uh, produced uh, this trim.contigs fast A file. So it's no longer fast Q, but fast A. Uh, so just the sequences, uh, the quality is um, kept in this separate quality file. Um, it also has some uh, scrap.context.qual and FASTA file. So if it failed to uh, produce a contig at all, if it didn't find any overlap, then it will discard those, uh, those pairs uh, and they will end up in this file. Um, and let's have a look at this file. Um, so yeah, this is uh, the fast A file. You see now that we started with um, a collection, uh, but now we only have uh, one fast A file. So what happened here was all the sequences from all the different samples um, are now in one fast A file, which is nice. It makes it easy to, to analyze, um, especially if you're not using Galaxy, it makes it easier to analyze um, one file rather than uh, 40 different ones. Uh, but now you have to uh, still remember where each read came from, from a sample in order to say anything uh, uh, later on in the analysis. Uh, so that is where the group file comes in. Uh, so you see here that we have 152,360 uh, total sequences across all our samples. Um, so this is, uh, these are the read names. There's also renamed the read names, uh, the read names a bit uh, to make it easier. So they're a bit shorter. Um, and you see that the group file that it makes um, now is a two column file, which has these read names. And the second column the, uh, is the sample name that it came from. Um, so during the rest of our analysis, we will pass on this information. We will give it the uh, fast A file and um, the mapping between reads and um, samples so that we can um, use this in our analysis. OK, so then we are going to start um, our first workflow to do this data cleaning. Um, so if you are using, again, this GTN in Galaxy function, you can just click this button here. And this is a nice new feature that uh, will automatically import the workflow to your account um, and start the run menu. So just one click and you get, um, you get this. So now it will ask you for the contigs. So uh, just be careful here. By default, it selects the scrap contigs. Um, but we want the uh, the trimmed context and not the ones that we throw away uh, and also the group file. So we uh, can run this workflow now. And just to show you the scrap uh, contact FASTA is empty. So there was nothing thrown away. So um, we are happy with that. OK, um, so give this a moment to run. Um, actually, if you aren't using GTN and Galaxy, if you have opened it separately, I can also show you uh, how you can import that while we wait. Um, 
So here I have the uh, tutorial open in a separate browser window. Um, if you now look at this hands-on to import this workflow, you see that you can now not click on this anymore. But below this, you see here um, the, the workflow link. So you can copy this link. You can uh, copy link, uh, right click and copy it. And then you go into Galaxy um, and you go to your workflow menu at the top. Um, and then you will see all the list of all the workflows you've used before. And then this import button at the top right, you can uh, just paste the URL and hit import to import your workflow. Um, so for the rest of this tutorial, I will use the uh, the one click button. Uh, but if you have a different setup, um, this is a way you can um, get these workflows into Galaxy um, the other way. Uh, so while we are here and while we are waiting, I will show you how you can see for each workflow what sort of happens behind the screen. Um, so if we go back to our workflow list, um, yeah, and once you've imported it, if you want to run the workflow, you just hit this play button. Um, so if you do use the one click option, you don't have to do that, but if you've imported it, it will appear in this list and you can use play to get the, to the run menu. Um, but now if we just want to see what uh, is in our workflow, we can click on the name here, click edit, that will bring us to the workflow editor. So here you see really the uh, overview of the workflow. You can zoom in a bit and out in the corner here. Um, so each of these boxes is a tool uh, and these ones on the left are input data sets. So you see that we take our contigs and our group file we run it through a tool called Summary Seek. So this is just getting some information about our data set. Uh, we do here the screening, the quality control, and then we do another summary. So then we can easily compare um, our data set before and after. And then after we do the cleaning, we do this uh, deduplicating step, we get the unique sequences, and then we also do the counting tool, uh, which uh, tracks how many of each of these unique sequences was found in each sample. Uh, so this is always nice to, uh, if you want a little bit more information, and if you click on one of these, for example, you can see on the right here, you can also see the parameters that are used um, for that step. So here you can see, for example, that uh, the minimum length for context is 10, and the maximum is 275. So anything that is longer than that will get thrown away, uh, or shorter uh, also. And indeed, the max ambiguous basis is set to zero. So it's quite strict. Um, so if you're finding after the step that you are throwing away too much of your data, maybe you want to increase this a little bit to uh, to allow a couple of uh, ambiguous bases there. Um, but that's really um, up to you and depending on um, your experiment and your um, research question. Um, okay, let's get back to Galaxy. So it's asking me to confirm to leave this page because I moved some of these boxes around and I didn't save my workflow, but. Uh, that's fine for us. So uh, why don't you wait till that is uh, workflow is finished and then see if you can answer this question from the tutorial. Um, how many sequences were removed during this cleaning step, the screening step, and how many unique sequences do we have in our clean data set at the end? So um, if you want to try and find these answers yourself, please pause the video here and then resume when you're ready to hear the answer. Okay, so once the workflow is done, let's have a look at the outputs. Um, okay, so remember here that we did a, a summary before and after this screening step. Um, you see here already that it produced two outputs, a good dot fasta. So these are the sequences we're keeping. Um, so you see that we're keeping 128 sequences. And I think we started with something like 150,000. So we've removed some. And here we can see the exact number. So in bad.acnos, um, these are the, the, the bad or the removed contigs. And if you uh, open that file in the middle, um, you can see more detail. So here, this is two columns. The first one is the contig name. And the second uh, is the reason why it was removed. 
So you see here that this uh, one underscore F3D0, that counting was removed because it had too many ambiguous spaces. Um, for example, this one was had too many ambiguous spaces and was the wrong length, was too long. Um, so then you can really see what was removed exactly. And if you want to summarize that a little bit more, because this is a big file with thousands of lines, of course, you can look at the summary output. Uh, so for this, um, let's have a look at the summary, the log, put, log file output. If you scroll to the bottom here, you see here it's sort of summarized. Um, you see here at the bottom the total number of sequences. So we had before screening 152,000. Um, and this um, sort of per quartile um, gives some characteristics. So you see here um, the length, for example. So most of these are really around uh, 252, 253, which is exactly what we expect for the V3. Uh, V4 region, uh, but for example, the largest contig uh, was 502 um, base pairs long, so that probably um, did not, um, uh, the contig did not assemble well, did not overlap well, and the shortest one is 248. And in a similar fashion, you see here that most of these um, have zero ambiguous bases, but the top 2.5% uh, the worst 2.5% had uh, six ambiguous spaces or more, and the very worst one had almost everything ambiguous. So this is really this, there's one read that really, or one pair that did not um, overlap well. So we'll throw that out. And now you can compare this to um, the, um, the after screening the uh, summary file. Um, the nicest way to do that is using this scratch pad at the top of Galaxy. So if you click this, it will stay yellow and have this check mark. And now if you click on an eye icon, so we're going to do it for uh, summary seeks before and after screen seeks, you see it opens in this uh, little window on top of Galaxy. Um, and we do it again here. Um, and you can move these around so that you can really sort of side by side compare. So we scroll to the bottom for these two. Uh, we see that we started with 152,000 reads. After filtering, we have 128,000 left. And you also see that um, all of them now have zero ambiguous spaces. And the longest contig is 270, no longer 502. So you see here the effects of this filtering. And we still have a lot of reads left over, so we are happy with this. If you see that you threw away like more than half of your reads here, maybe um, be a little bit less strict or uh, check that everything went OK with your uh, sequencing in the wet lab. OK, we can close these windows again and disable the scratch bed by clicking on it again. Um, let's see what else do we have here. So the unique sequences. So here we see that um, of these 128,000, there are only 16,000 different sequences. The rest are all duplicates. Uh, again, that's very expected for this our 16S analysis. Um, and then this output file, we can look real quick. Um, here you see it's remembered um, that this read is representative for all these other contigs that are identical. Um, so this is really uh, also 16,000 lines. For some reason, it's only showing the first three. It's only showing the first so many megabytes, I guess. Um, but yeah, um, it will remember what uh, each of these unique sequences or representative sequences, they call them, uh, which other ones are identical to it. And this is summarized further in a count table. Um, so if we look at that, um, here we really see the breakdown of each of these representative sequences and how many times it occurred in total and how many times it occurred per sample. So for example, two underscore F3D0, this representative sequence um, occurred 4,402 times in total, uh, 370 times in uh, sample F3D0, 29 times in F3D1, etc. So all during the rest of our analysis, we are going to use our FASTA file uh, and this count table so that we can really um, know 
any analysis we do on these uh, unique sequences, uh, we can map that back to uh, how many were uh, in each sample. Okay, and with that, we have finished our first uh, data cleaning section. So uh, now we can move on to sequence alignment. Okay, so for sequence alignment, we also have a dedicated tutorial. So if you uh, want more background on this, uh, I encourage you to check out that tutorial. Um, so we're gonna start by aligning um, uh, our sequence to a reference alignment. So um, this isn't always done in these types of analysis, but um, the creators of the mother package um, have a nice paper here where they showed it does improve your OTU clustering. Uh, so we're gonna do uh, follow their recommendation. Um, so we're gonna use the align.seq tool to align our unique sequences to um, a reference genome. So we click on that tool again. Um, and you see in the start, we also imported this silva v4.fasta file. So that's the reference uh, genome for the 16S uh, gene. Um, here we um, subsampled that um, reference to only include the v4 region to speed up our uh, mapping because we know they should only uh, map to that region anyway. Uh, but you can also use the full reference there. That's fine. Um, so again, uh, it'll ask us for uh, what we want to align. So the unique um, sequences, the fast output. And then it asks about the reference genome. So um, it says here cached reference. That means um, some galaxies may have some pre-configured um, references for you that you can use. Uh, but you can also change this to your history and provide your own reference. So we're gonna change this um, reference uh, to the Silva v4.fasta that we imported. Um, and the rest we will leave to the defaults and we will run. Okay, so once that is done, just have a look at the output and uh, see what you see. Um, and you can do another uh, summary after that as well. Uh, because if you do summary.seeks on an aligned file, it'll give you a little bit more information about where um, the alignment happened uh, in the reference. Um, and we can use this to really, um, we can filter some more than for um, any reason that did not map nicely to the V4 region, uh, we can get rid of those. Okay, so um, let's wait till this is done and have a look at the output. Okay, so after it's done, let's look at the align output here. So you see this is again a fast A file, um, but now you see all these dots. Uh, and if you scroll to the right, you see there's a lot of dots. So you may think, oh, what's going on here? But if you scroll to the right further, you will start to see um, some alignments. So we have to get really to the V4 region of the um, reference first. And then we can see that here our uh, reads start to align. Uh, but of course, this is not a very nice uh, format to look at. Um, so there's also a little bit of summary information in the align report here. Um, we'll have a quick look at that. Um, so here you see again per contig, you can see a little bit the, the length of the contig and some um, information about how it aligned. So here the uh, the score. So there was a perfect match found here um, and some of them um, did not have a perfect match, but um, that's still okay. And you can see a little bit uh, where it stopped and start. Okay, so based on this alignment, um, Oh, we should do summary.seeks. Um, yeah, so I'll start that. So in the same way we got information about our fast A file before with summary.seeks, if we provide it with an aligned FASTA file, it will also um, give us some information about the alignment. And um, yeah, if 
we now will always give it a FASTA file and a count table so that if it removes anything at any point, it can remove it from both these files so that they stay in sync. So we'll run the tool. Uh, but while we wait, we'll just peek quickly in the um, training manual to see the output that we will get here. So here we see um, the number of unique sequences now listed and the total number that it represents. Um, so we see here that these 16,000 unique sequences represent 128,000 um, total sequences. Um, and you see here that most of them align pretty well to the V4 region, so we know that the V4 region um, is between 1968 and 1550 uh, on the uh, 16S uh, reference um, gene. So most of these align pretty pretty nicely over the region. Uh, you see again that there's some outliers that um, don't overlap quite as nicely um, either uh, on either end. So again, we can use this uh, to do some more filtering. Um, you also now see this um, polymer, homopolymer uh, column. So this is the number of homopolymer stretches that uh, the largest that it finds. Um, so we know that in our V4 region, there is no more than I think uh, a stretch of five, the same uh, nucleotides expected in a row. Uh, and sequencers are notoriously bad at resolving these homopolymer stretches. So they have a hard time uh, when they encounter something like that to um, confidently say whether they saw five A's in a row or six or seven or eight. Um, so if we see here too many, that, that might just be a, um, a sequencing error. So again, we will throw that away so that it doesn't confound our data. Um, so yes, based on this alignment, we will in uh, our next workflow, we will do further cleaning up. So this is what will happen. We will uh, remove any reads that do not over uh, overlap the V4 region nicely. We will remove any overhangs on either side, again, that um, do not uh, uh, overlap the V4 region uh, with screen.seeks and filter.seeks. Um, we will also simplify this uh, alignment file a little bit by removing columns that have a dot everywhere. Uh, and just remember that um, we're looking at uh, the V4 region. Um, again, anytime we filter or clean up, we might be introducing new duplicate sequences. So we want to run the unique uh, command again. So for example, if we had two contigs that uh, were identical, except for the last base, uh, and we now remove the last base, um, then the resulting contigs are identical again, and you get some duplication. So to avoid this, we run unique seeks again. Um, last uh, cleaning step here is pre-clustering. So uh, any two contigs at this point that differ by only one or two bases um, are more likely to be a result of sequencing error than real biological vi variation. So we're going to use this pre-cluster tool to sort of um, map these together and treat them as one. Um, and then the last step in this uh, second cleaning um, workflow will be chimera removal. Um, so chimeras are some are sequencing artifacts uh, that can occur during PCR. Um, the word chimera comes from Greek mythology uh, and is used for an animal that is like a hybrid between two animals. So for example, the head of a lion and the body of a bird. Um, and this can happen during PCR where um, something goes wrong and as a result to um, unrelated um, sequences sort of form a hybrid sequence. Uh, so we can detect these things or remove them um, to uh, yeah, improve the quality of our data. So that will be um, the next workflow. Um, so let's click here uh, on data cleaning and camera removal. And then um, it wants us to provide it's with the aligned sequences and the count table. All right, so it looks like I already selected the right ones. So the align file from align.seeks and our most recent count table, and uh, we hit run. 
Okay, so um, while that runs, uh, when it's finished, see if you can answer these questions from the tutorial. So see if you can find out how many of these chimeras were found and how many sequences uh, remain after the second round of cleaning. Um, so pause the video now if you would like to um, find these answers yourself and then resume when you're ready to discuss the results. Okay, so let's have a look at the results. Um, so we see here that we um, look at the chimeras first. So chimera.psearch uh, identifies chimeras. So here it will list how many it found. So 3,441 uh, of the unique sequences were determined to be um, chimeras. Um, and we can check later how many of the total sequences that represent. Um, and then you see that in remove.seeks, uh, it did the actual removal. And uh, we can, again did a summary um, after all this and uh, before. So if we compare those two again, so we can take here the scratch pad, we can look at the last um, summary.seeks log file compare that. So before this whole um, second round of uh, cleaning, we had uh, 16,000 unique sequences, which represented 128,000 um, total sequences. And if we look now at the log file at the end, um, here, and we scroll to the bottom, we see that after filtering, we now have uh, 2,000 unique sequences. So that really sounds like a big uh, big reduction from 16,000 to 2,000 uh, something. But if you look at the total sequences that represents, you see that we only lost about 10,000. So a lot of these sequences um, were, uh, were unique, where it did not have duplicates. Uh, and that's expected for things like chimeras, that they only occur once exactly that way, or uh, things that um, were sequenced very poorly and other artifacts. Uh, so in fact, this, is, um, this looks quite good. Uh, and the other change you see here between these two is um, you see now also that the homopolymers um, have been filtered. So the, the, the longest homopolymer stretch in our data is now eight. Uh, which is also where we set the threshold in screen seeks instead of this 12. Okay, so now we have a very clean data. Uh, let's see, uh, for example, uh, the pre clustering output, just so you can see real quick what that looks like. Uh, yeah, sure, in the scratch pad. So this is uh, again a FASTA file, but it now has some alignment and we got rid of um, this long uh, line of dots uh, at the beginning because they were dots for all the, all the different contigs. So this again simplifies and reduces the size of our data. Okay, I'm gonna uncheck the scratch pad before I forget. Okay, so let's move on. So now that our next step, we can get around to taxonomic classification. We will do this using a Bayesian classifier, uh, using the classify.seeks Mother tool. And we will use a um, training set that was also um, created by the uh, developers of Mother um, and um, prepared in the Mother format. And this is based on the RDP project, the ribosomal database project, uh, which you can read about more here. So before we begin, a quick uh, remark about taxonomic assignment. So there are many different approaches you can use here. So there's a nice overview in this paper that is linked here. So there are lots of different um, algorithms and lots of different uh, approaches um, and also lots of different reference taxonomies that you can use. Um, so you have Silva, Green Genes, RDP, and CBI are some of the most popular ones. Um, and just, um, yeah, the thing to remember about this is that what you choose here does impact your uh, results. So you should carefully um, figure out what is most suitable in your situation. So in this paper, they also compared this nicely. So here they had three uh, different data sets. Each of these uh, graphs is a different data set and different uh, approaches and um, reference taxonomies. 
And if we look here, for example, at the mouse data set, uh, if you use green genes, um, this here uh, in each panel is the relative abundance. So you see here that you really only identify two species at a pretty consistent um, abundance. Um, and on this axis, by the way, is different uh, V regions. So you see here, if you use a different approach or different database, you will get very different results. So for example, here, you find much more richness in the same sample. And also, if you compare left to right within one of these, you see here that depending on which V region you uh, sequence, you are going to find different results. Uh, so all this is to say that which method here is the best really depends on um, the type of sequencing you did, the type of uh, community uh, you are expecting to find, uh, and your research question. So do a little bit of research here. Um, there's some good resources here to really uh, think about what is the best suited for you. There's no one size fits all solution, unfortunately. Um, there's another nice discussion linked here as well. Okay, so we will now classify um, our um, contigs. Uh, and once we do that, we can also do like a final step of cleaning because anything that is not classified as bacteria, uh, we are not interested in uh, for our research question. Um, so we'll remove it. So there might still be some uh, 18S RNA gene fragments or um, 16S fragments from uh, archaea, chloroplasts, mitochondria um, that may have survived all our uh, previous cleaning steps, um, uh, but that we will identify now and we will get rid of these. So let's run our next workflow, taxonomic classification. Uh, we will load that. Uh, it'll want from us um, our latest uh, FASTA and count table. So these will be the output from remove.seq where we remove the chimeras. And then it wants our um, uh, reference taxonomy and reference um, set. So we will give those um, as well. So here, remove seeks FASTA, remove seeks pick.count. So I already selected the right ones for me, but double check that. Um, for the FASTA file, we're going to give it one of the files we uploaded at the start, train set 9 PDS FASTA, and the reference taxonomy. OK, and then we hit run on that. So again, wait until that's finished and then see if you can answer this question. Uh, how many non-bacterial sequences were removed? Uh, and again, try to find both the representative sequences uh, that were removed and how many total sequences those represent. OK, so now we will have a look at the results. So you can see here uh, that it did the classification and then it removed some things. Um, if you want to see exactly what we told it to remove, you can rerun this uh, remove lineage tool to find out the exact settings that were used in the workflow. Or you could, of course, um, load the workflow in the workflow editor and find it there. Uh, so you see here that in this tool, you can um, provide some taxons for it to filter out. So we uh, remove chloroplasts, mitochondria, uh, anything that was unknown, archaea, and eukaryotes. Um, so now the question was, uh, how many? Uh, so let's actually also look at the taxonomy output, I think, maybe the text summary. Uh, so here you see this file uh, contains for every contig, it assigned a taxonomy. So this is a kingdom bacteria, phylum this, all the way down to a species level or a genus level. Um, and then this other output from classify.seq uh, summarizes that a little bit. So you can see here for every uh, taxon, um, you can see here um, the split by sample. Um, um, and now the question was, um, uh, how many were removed, um, these non-bacterial ones? So here we can again use the scratch pad and look at the summary before and after. So uh, let's find the one before. So before we did classification and removal, 
uh, that summary.seq log file and compare it to our latest one after the removal. Um, so side by side, scroll to the bottom. So we see that we start out with uh, 2,279 unique sequences, and uh, that's down to 20. So uh, that's by 20. So 20 of them were uh, non-bacterial. And in total, that was, uh, well, 118,091 minus 117,099 total sequences that that represented. So again, um, not a lot of difference here, but uh, we cleaned our data a little bit further. Okay, so in the next section, we will now show you how to uh, use a mock sample to assess the error rate of your method. Um, this is an optional section, so if you're not so interested in this, you can just skip to the next section uh, without any problems. So uh, everything we do in this section will not be used in the rest. Um, but if you would like to see how this works, uh, stick around for this section. So a mock community is a artificial sample that you sequence along with your real data um, in order to assess the uh, error of your uh, method, of your experiment. Um, and this mock community um, you construct so you know exactly which um, organisms are present and at which uh, proportions. Um, so of course you hope to find back um, after your sequencing and after your bioinformatics analysis, you hope to find exactly what you know was there. Uh, but if you don't, you get a, at least a measure of how close you got. Um, so usually you put um, some similar species in there uh, to what you expect to find in your samples. Um, so there is a nice paper on this uh, linked here in the um, tutorial as well. So this is an example. They had this mock um, community on the left. So they had 20 samples, um, each at equal proportions. And then they um, used different methods. So they uh, sequenced different um, variable regions, uh, also with different methods. Uh, and you see that um, they got pretty different results. So uh, most of these detected most of the uh, organisms, but the proportions at which they found them um, varied significantly. Uh, and this is again to say that uh, doing something like this, maybe trying different methods to see which method gets you closest to your known um, sample um, can really help improve your quality. So if you can sequence this along with your samples. Um, yeah, there's some more, there's some further reading on this if you're interested. Um, so in this, in our tutorial data, we also have one of these mock samples. Um, so we are going to extract these samples first and then do uh, an analysis on that to see how close we get to the expected um, results. Um, so we're going to use get groups for that. Uh, just to show you quickly, back in our original um, set of samples, you see here we have all our real data in pairs, but we also have this mock sample. So that was our uh, artificial sample. So we're now going to extract um, the data from our um, FASTA file and FASTQ file, uh, sorry, count table, um, all the data about this mock sample so that we can um, analyze it further. So get groups. And we are going to uh, give it um, the count table and FASTA from our latest step where we removed the uh, non-bacterial species, removed that lineage. Uh, we're going to tell it to extract the mock sample. And we want to see the log output file. OK, so let's see. Uh, we have here our count table from remove lineage um, and our FASTA file. Oh, so it's just loading this file, and it's also looking inside this file uh, at the group name so that it can let us choose here uh, which uh, group or sample we want to extract. So we want to select mock here 
that's it. You can do multiple ones if you ever need. Um, and then we also give it here the FASTA from remove.lineage. And then the final thing is at the bottom, we say yes to the uh, log file. Again, it's reading inside the file to offer us the group. So this may take a little bit longer. Um, but once we can, we will click this and we will run the tool. Okay, so in the log file, you will see um, that, um, see how many um, sequences it selected. So 58 unique sequences representing uh, 4,046 total sequences. Um, next, we will use the tool called seek.error, uh, which is uh, made for uh, for these sort of um, error estimations. So we're going to give it uh, our fast and count file of our mock community. And we're also going to give it as a reference, we're going to give it um, the sequences that we know we put in there. And then we can estimate how close it got. Um, so. Okay, our previous tool hasn't finished yet or it's just starting now, but we can already um, queue this tool. So let's click on there, seek.error. And we are gonna give it, uh, yes, our FASTFL from get groups. We again wanna give um, as a reference a file from our history. Um, so let's see, let's double check, uh, FASTA, um, yeah, okay. Um, so we scroll down to the bottom and we choose here the uh, HMP underscore mock. Um, and I think the count table was the last thing and output, okay. So count table, okay. Output yes, count table also from get groups. And we run this tool. So while we wait, I will show you quickly um, what this mock reference looks like. So we scroll back to the bottom. Um, this mock fell up. I've still got my scratch pad on. I will turn that off. Uh, but oh, actually, we can see it fine here. Uh, so you see here, this is just a FASTA file with. Um, all of our um, um, sequences for the uh, species we put in. All right, so we're just gonna wait for that to finish. Um, but in the meantime, we can already uh, have a look at the um, tutorial to see what will come out here. So uh, once this is done, we will see some output like this in our um, log file. Um, and this will show the overall error rate it detected. Um, so it's a pretty low error rate. So this gives us some confidence in our method. Um, and then as uh, the next step, we will uh, now cluster these mock sequences into OTUs. Um, so uh, OTUs are basically um, placeholders for, um, the, it stands for op operational taxon taxonomic unit. So you basically you cluster similar, um, similar sequences and you can set different thresholds here. So you can um, say um, set a 97% identity threshold is often used. And this is sort of a proxy for a genus level uh, similarity. Um, you can also have a different uh, or cluster it um, on higher identity if you want. So we'll use this as sort of a, a proxy for uh, different taxons. Um, so yeah, just groups of, um, of um, sequences. And so we'll do this for our mock community. Um, and then we can um, sort of um, do some more um, error control on this. Um, we want to see also, we want to uh, reassure ourselves that we have captured the full diversity of our sample. Um, so one of the things we can do here is um, generate the rarefaction curves. 
So what this really is, is we uh, subsample our data and say, let's say we didn't take all our data, but only use half our data. Uh, how many OTUs, how many um, of these organisms would we have found? And what you want to see there then is, uh, ideally you will see something like this green graph. Um, so you want to see that, okay, using all our data, we found uh, this many OTUs. If we had used half our data, we also found that. So this also makes you think like, okay, if we sequence more, we're not really going to find any more diversity. We've really captured everything we can. Um, if you see something more like this blue line, um, you see it's starting to level off, so that's good. But if you sequence a bit more, you might still find a couple of additional OTUs, a couple of additional um, um, organisms. Um, and if you really have something like this brown line, then you really have not begun to capture the full diversity of your sample yet. So if you uh, sample more, you expect to find a lot more uh, different OTUs, different uh, species. Um, yeah, so this is, we are going to generate these rarefaction curves so that we get a feeling for whether we uh, sequence enough to capture the full diversity of our sample. Okay, so this is done um, in this next workflow. Um, so click on mock OTU clustering. Um, so it hasn't finished for me yet, but that's okay. We can already start this new um, workflow. Again, let's have a peek to make sure we do this right. Um, so we're gonna give it uh, the count table and FASTA from uh, get groups. Um, so that one is right, and this one, uh, get groups faster, uh, and run the workflow. Okay, so let that run, and then try to see if you can uh, find out how many OTUs um, we discovered in our uh, mock community, and here we use the 97 percent identity threshold, uh, which will be um, displayed as uh, 0.03, so sort of a difference metric, the inversion of that. All right, so pause it here uh, if you want to find the answer yourself, and then resume if you want to hear the answer. Okay, so let's have a look at the results once it's finished. Um, so the question was, how many OTUs did we find in our mock? sequence. Um, so we can find that in different files here. So let's start here. Uh, after clustering, we get an OTU list. We can look at that. Um, okay, normally this sort of displays as a proper table, but now it doesn't. But this is the header line. So we see that we have uh, 34 OD OTUs, uh, and they're just numbered 1 to 34. And then here you can see um, which um, uh, contigs map to this uh, OTU. So we have one line here at this similarity level. So it's also possible to do multiple similarity levels at the same time with Mother, but we just care about the 97% uh, identity. Uh, that's the standard. Uh, so 34 total. And then you see here, um, they ordered them from large to smallest. So um, most of them, um, OTU1 has the most um, context as part of it, and then down to um, one for these last ones. Um, and let's look also at, uh, let's see, there are faction curves. So here we did some subsampling. Again, you can do this for different measures. We'll uh, explain more about this later, uh, different diversity me measures. But here you see that, um, if you use all your data, uh, like at the bottom here, that we have 34 ODUs. Uh, if we say use 3,000 um, reads instead of 4,000, we have uh, 30 OTUs. Um, so you see the leveling off is starting, so it's a steep line here. And uh, now we can also plot this if we want, and we will do that for a real data set. Um, but yeah we see now uh, the number of OTUs. And if we can compare that with how many um, um, 
organisms we put in our mock sequence. So let's look quickly here. Oh, we can just expand it. So um, in our reference um, set, so we had 32 uh, sequences in our mock sample, uh, 32 different organisms. So we get uh, pretty close to that. So not exactly. So there is some difference there, but uh, yeah, that's quite common and it's still quite good. Okay, so with that, we sort of convinced ourselves that we have uh, a good method here, both in the wet lab and the dry lab. So then we can now sort of redo this OTU clustering, uh, but for our real samples. Um, so that will be the next uh, section. Um, so I'm just going to explain this again for those who skipped over the mock community section. Um, so in this section, we are going to um, classify, cluster our contigs into uh, operational taxonomic units. Um, so these are just uh, clusters of very similar uh, reads very similar contexts um, that we use as a proxy for uh, taxons. So we can do this in multiple uh, identity thresholds. So you will commonly see a 90%, 97% identity. So clusters that are um, at most 3% have a most 3% difference. Um, and this is often used as a placeholder for genus level similarity, but you could also go up to, um, you could uh, require more sequence identity to go to like species or strain level. Uh, but just remember that um, it is a little bit questionable how uh, precisely you can go with 16S uh, data because it is a highly conserved, um, gene and you're only looking at one gene. Um, so usually uh, it's only really reliable up to genus level and if you want more power there you should look into methods like uh, shotgun sequencing to get uh, more data and more power. Um, so yeah we're going to cluster our contigs into um, similar, um, similar groups and then we are going to uh, do a taxon, uh, assign taxonomy, another classification on those. Um, so let's do that. So the next uh, workflow will do that. Um, it will first remove all the mock sequences because we only care about our real data from now on. Um, so we are going to uh, start this workflow. And we are going to give it our latest um, FASTA file and count table and the taxonomy that we uh, determined, all from remove lineage. So uh, be careful here. The uh, default, if you did the OTU section, the defaults will be um, from, from there. Uh, remove lineage, FASTA, count table from remove lineage, and taxonomy from remove lineage, and run. Okay, so this workflow um, cl oh, clusters into OTUs, uh, redoes the classification step on those OTUs, so finds the consensus uh, or uses the consensus sequence. And uh, we will also, oh no, that's the next section. In the next section, we will use these OTUs to say something about uh, diversity. But let's first wait until this um, workflow is done and then we'll have a look at the outputs. Okay, let's look at the outputs and then see if we can answer this question. Um, which samples contain sequences belonging to uh, an OTU that was classified as Staphylococcus? Um, so you see here it made some new outputs. Um, we removed first the mock file, um, then we clustered and classified. So let's look at the outputs of this classification. Uh, I think we need the uh, summary. Um, so you see that that is a, a collection again. Uh, it only contains one um, 
one file here, and this is 0 0.03, meaning the 97% identity. So you could have also asked Mother to do this for multiple levels at once, but let's look at this one. So here you see uh, all the different taxons that were identified, um, and also how many times it appears per sample. Uh, so the question was about Staphylococcus, so we're just going to search for that. I'm going to copy it here, and then I'm just going to paste it in my browser with Control F. Um, so we see here that it does appear, uh, and then you can see here um, that it appears uh, once or zero times. So to know which um, files these are, we need to zoom out a little bit. Um, so let's see if this is enough. So we see here that um, it appears, for example, in, uh, am I in the right row? In sample uh, 141, 142, but not in day one, uh, and in 144, 145, and not in most of the other ones. So this could definitely be something that uh, was introduced later in the mouse's life. So in the first 10 days, um, there was no Staphylococcus in the gut microbiome, but after 150 days, uh, it did pick that up. Um, yeah, so with this classification, you can see things like that. So let's zoom back in. Um, let's see the other files that it made real quick. So this is just uh, the same classification, but on the OTU level. So uh, not mapped back to the samples, but for each OTU, the size of the OTU and the classification. So this is a really um, kingdom bacteria, uh, phylum bacteria, and all the way down to um, genus or species maybe level. Um, okay. So now that we have this classification, uh, we can use it for a diversity analysis. So that'll be the next section. So there are uh, different types of diversity analysis. Um, but first, a general um, sort of remark about diversity. So this isn't something, um, some constant that you can measure directly. So when we talk about diversity, usually we talk about a combination of different concepts. Um, so it's explained a little bit in this background box. Um, so we have alpha diversity that really talks about the uh, ecological complexity within a single sample. Uh, and if you're looking to compare samples, you're talking about beta diversity. Um, so this diversity is a valuable tool for describing ecological complexity of your sample, um, but it is really a more of a um, combination of these three concepts. So you have species richness, which is simply the number of different species in your community of different organisms. Um, then you also have the species evenness. So that is also compares like um, the proportion of these different species. So how many do I have each of these? Um, and also takes into account uh, phylogenetic diversity, like how closely related are the different species in my community? Um, so just a little illustration of this. So say you have community A here and community B, uh, which one of these has the highest richness? Um, and which one has the highest evenness. So again, think about this uh, yourself, pause the video and, and continue when you want to know the answer. So remember that species richness was the number of different species in a community. So if you count them here, you see four different species. And here actually you see the same four different species. So, so these two have the same richness. Uh, but if you uh, now for yourself would have to say which one of these is more diverse, what would you say? So you'd probably say community B, and that is because here most of these, uh, most of the community is dominated by one species, by this yellow one. Um, so diversity, you already see also um, includes a little bit of um, the proportion of the different species. So that is evenness. Um, so you see here that uh, B is more even than A because uh, it has more similar proportions. 
Um, so those are the two concepts that come into play. But then also um, you might think, well, it depends on how closely related these um, species might be. So let's say you have these two communities now shown as a phylogenetic tree. So um, on the left here, um, let's say um, you have these red, uh, red um, species are part of your community. Um, and in another sample uh, is the blue sample, which one would you say is more diverse? So you'd probably say um, community, the red community here, because um, these are less closely related to each other um, than B. So B has one, two, three, four, five, six different species in it, and A only five. However, these um, the blue species are all very closely related, this community, and these are more um, genetically different. So you would say this is more diverse. So when we talk about diversity, it is sort of a combination of all these different concepts. Uh, and there's no single best way to quantify this. So many people uh, have defined many different uh, metrics. Um, so these are all named after very smart researchers who all had their own ideas about um, this diversity. Um, and mother tools, will uh, you can have them calculate all these different uh, metrics. And uh, if you want to read some more about them, uh, I have good papers linked here. And again, this is a case of which one to use um, depends on um, your research question, your uh, experimental setup and everything. Um, so we will do alpha diversity first. Um, so again, we can use this to generate sort of these rarefaction curves. Um, and here we want to see, I will explain again for the people who did not do the uh, mock community section, um, but these rarefaction curves, um, you sort of, you plot your diversity as a function of um, the data you've used. So in the end here, if you use all, uh, all the data of your, all your samples, um, how many, uh, what is the diversity that you capture? How many different species OTUs do you capture? And let's say if you only uh, use half of your data, how many do you find? And now what you ideally would like to see is a, um, a curve like this green one, which um, says like, um, I do not find additional OTUs uh, if I would sequence more. So it's already um, leveled off. So you uh, have probably captured the full diversity of your sample. Uh, in this blue one, however, uh, it's not quite leveled off yet, but it's starting to. Um, so here, if you sequence more, um, more of your sample, uh, then you would probably identify a few more species, a couple more OTUs, uh, but maybe not that much. So you, you are almost there. But if you have something like this brown uh, line, then it's really, it hasn't started to level off yet. So you've not begun to capture the full diversity um, of your sample. And if you would sample more, sequence more, and then you probably find a lot of additional um, organisms there. Uh, so then you maybe want to uh, reevaluate if um, you want to redo anything um, or sequence more, for example. So um, this time we will get these refraction plots. We will um, um, get some diversity metrics and then plot these uh, on the basis of that. So let's start this workflow. And this time I'll ask for our the shared file for make.shared. Um, Let's see where that is. So I haven't discussed that one yet. So that is another um, mother specific format. Um, so we can look at this real quick. Um, so this basically tells you um, for all the OTUs, um, how many were found in every sample. So for uh, uh, day zero, on uh, this uh, similarity level, how many 
how big each of these OTUs was, how many um, contexts mapped to each of those, and repeated for all your samples. So this is uh, similar to your account file, except uh, OTU based. OK, so let's do that again. So we're going to do workflow number six, alpha diversity, and just give it this shared file that has all the information about all our OTUs uh, across different samples. Okay, make shared, that's fine, run workflow. Okay. So while that runs, we can already get a sneak peek of what we will see. Um, so we plot the rarefaction uh, for every one of our samples. Um, so um, we get the, uh, the diversity metrics first at different levels, the refraction. So we have here the SOBs is the observed richness. So it's simply the number of OTUs. Um, and you have different metrics here. Uh, and you can read about these in more detail if you want. Um, so this is uh, inverse Simpson index is some probability based um, diversity metric. Um, and then you will get a file like this. Um, you can also ask mother to uh, add more different metrics here. So there's a whole, the whole list I showed you, you can um, have all those um, calculated by mother for you. Um, and here it's uh, for all the samples. So SOBS is the simplest one. So that's the, uh, the richness, the number of OTUs. Um, So some things we can observe from this file are uh, we can see if uh, we see any um, big differences between, for example, the early and late time points. So here you see nothing really obvious. So um, there's no big difference in diversity between mice on day zero and day 150. And uh, we also see that the coverage, uh, so most of these OTUs um, are well covered by multiple sequences. Uh, so that's also something we like to see. Um, okay, so if you want some more diversity information about diversity metrics, um, the Mother Wiki page has uh, good explanations of what they all are and how they are cal calculated. Um, so we could do more analysis um, and statistical tests like ANOVA to um, confirm this feeling that there's no significant difference between um, early and late and maybe uh, male and female mice if we had that data, but that is um, uh, beyond the scope of this tutorial, uh, but you could use the full data set from Mother if you wanted to look into those things. Um, so after alpha diversity, let's see if this is finished now. Uh, Almost. Uh, oh no, it still needs to do some more. Um, oh. So I'm just going to wait for it to finish and then we can quickly look at the real files, but we've already discussed the contents. Okay, so after it's finished, we can have a look at all the output files. Um, so we did some subsampling to get the rarefaction um, and we um, calculated the uh, diversity metrics on here. So we can have a quick look. So this is just the observed OTUs, the number of OTUs. Um, yeah, so here you can see at different subsampling levels, how many OTUs you find and um, some samples had more sequences to begin with than others, so then there's an NA here. Um, so we can um, plot these. So we did that here. And if we look at that, we see, um, okay, the fonts are not working on this galaxy apparently. Um, 
what we can see here in the um, in the tutorial, what it's meant to look like. So I get to the right place here. So number of OTUs plotted there and number of sequences. So we see this leveling off uh, happening, uh, or at least starting to happen for most of our sequences. So that is reassuring. Um, we do see a few uh, sequence a bit more for some of these, you'd probably find a couple of additional OTUs, um, but the bulk is already um, captured. Okay, so next up we will now, because uh, this was all uh, alpha diversity, so we looked at a single sample and wanted to say something about the diversity uh, in there. But now if we want to compare samples so, or groups of samples, if we want to say, is it more diverse in the late time points than in the early time points, then we need beta diversity. Um, so here you have, again, the exact same uh, situation uh, where there isn't just one um, beta diversity metrics. You have a whole, uh, whole list of different ways to calculate this. Uh, again, there's some nice links in here if you want to read up about the details. Um, so we will calculate beta diversity and then we'll try to um, plot this a little bit so we can see if we can find some um, differences in our samples. So to do this, let's start. And uh, this is our final workflow of this tutorial, the beta diversity analysis. So we load that into Galaxy. We give it the shared file for make shared and our subsampled shared. Okay, make shared, and that is not the right one, so sample shared, and run. Okay, uh, while that runs, uh, I can already show you the results because they're in the uh, tutorial. Um, so we use here this um, beta diversity calculator and how exactly that is calculated, you can read up about there. Um, and then we try to make um, some uh, heat maps like this. So here you have all the uh, different samples plotted and again on this axis and then you can see uh, the darker the color the more similar they are. So you see here that this sample I think it's day four is very similar to uh, I think these are the other early time points so um, we, could, we can read this uh, when it's generated in Galaxy properly. Uh, but here, so you can sort of see clusters. So these sort of the late ones cluster together, except for this one early one. Um, and the early ones also cluster together a little bit. Um, and of course, if you use a different um, calculator, you will get different looking results. So again, look into what uh, is most suitable in your situation. Uh, another thing we can do is we can uh, sort of um, represent it by a Venn diagram. So of course this won't work if you want to compare uh, lots of different samples, but up to say four, uh, it can be quite nice. So here we have compared four uh, different samples, uh, so the first four days. And uh, you can see here that most of the uh, OTUs are shared by all four of these. Um, and there are, let's say, between 8 and 18 ones that are unique um, to one sample, and all the others are sort of uh, shared by two or three of these samples. So again, this can give you a little bit of a feeling for how similar these different uh, communities are. Um, so if this number here that they share is very high, they're very similar, and if this is uh, only a handful and sort of the numbers on the outside here are very big, then you can say these are very different uh, communities with a little overlap. And the final sort of um, way we can represent this, the final uh, visualization here is in the form of a tree. So um, we can cluster the similar, most similar ones together. So you see that we do see here nicely this clustering between sort of the early time points uh, on one hand and the late time points on the other hand. So you do see that there was some difference here between early and late, um, except maybe this, uh, this very first day, though that is um, yeah very high up here. Um, 
yeah, so that's another nice sort of way to represent that and to compare that. Okay, and then the very last thing we will do in this tutorial is we will get a nice Krona plot of our community so we can really get an interactive plot here um, that shows us our uh, the composition of our samples. So we have this Krona uh, tool in Galaxy, uh, but before we can do that, we have to convert our taxonomy file uh, that we got from the uh, classify.otu tool and convert it to a format that Krona can, um, can understand and can um, plot. So we uh, made a special tool for this in Galaxy called taxonomy to Krona. So we're gonna run that tool now. And we are going to give it our um, classify.otu. Uh, um, and note that that is a collection. So you have to change here from single data set. It says it can't find anything. But if you click here on the data set collection option, you can, can select the taxonomy from uh, classify.otu. OK, and that's all you need here, and then you just run this tool. And then we'll already queue the next one. Then you can run Krona on these um, Krona formatted taxonomies. Okay, again, this is a, oh, we need to change it to tabular first. And then I think it's uh, yeah, it's another um, collection, a list with one data set. So again, we click here on data set collection and then make sure we input this taxonomy to Krona file. Galaxy is becoming a little bit slow for me. All the Americans must be waking up. I am in Europe myself. Um, yes, here, if we do taxonomy to Krona, uh, we can run this tool. Okay, um, you can wait for that to finish, but there's also um, the plot. The interactive plot is here in the um, tutorial as well. So this is what you will get. Uh, you will get here um, the composition uh, of your community. Uh, so you see here on uh, different uh, levels. So you see that 100% are um, of kingdom bacteria. And then you see you have here uh, a couple different phyla. Uh, and if you want to zoom in on one of those, you can really double click those and it'll zoom in like that. And you can like look at different levels and see um, the relative abundance of all these types. Or you can go back up to bacteria this way. So this is a nice way to interactively explore your sample. Now you see that here it took basically our entire FASTA file. So you can't uh, compare it by sample now. This is everything together. And if you want to do it by sample, there is a nice, um, nice uh, exercise at the bottom here. So uh, you can redo the classification step to give you a taxonomy file per sample. Um, and then again, you can convert this to Krona format and run Krona. Um, try to do this yourself as an exercise. The full solution of how to do this is given here. Um, uh, oh, the solution. Let's see if the Krona plot. Yeah, the Krona plot is in here. Um, so if you do this this way, then you see now that you see get here. You can switch. You get one output basically with different Krona plots in it. So you can here switch between different um, different samples to see how the uh, composition changed of your uh, gut microbiome. Um, so this is a very nice tool to interactively explore. Okay, so now you've um, finished the uh, mother standard operating procedure for Illumina MySeq data. Um, here's another overview. Um, yeah, so uh, well done. Uh, the main things to remember here is that um, 
many different choices you make over the course of um, your analysis here can influence your, uh, your final results. So make sure you understand the differences and understand what is appropriate for your situation. Um, also, quality control, uh, as with any uh, analysis, is very, um, very important. So don't skip over this. Make sure you uh, have you clean up your data, um, make sure your data is uh, high quality enough. And if it isn't, uh, maybe consider redoing some of the sequencing or doing some additional sequencing uh, to really uh, increase the power of your experiment. Uh, you can sequence a mock community together with uh, with your samples. So um, for example, labs I've worked with, they did this with every group of um, this many patients. They uh, sequenced them at once and also did a mock community as a sort of quality control step uh, every time they ran it. And um, yes, you can explore alpha and beta diversity using different uh, tools um, such as Krona. So thank you all for uh, listening. And let me know if you have any questions.